And I am, for those of you who don't know me, I am Jolie Brandt. I'm the mental health lead in student services. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are going to be recording this session um, for anyone who may want to uh, join and uh, see the recording late at a later date. Um, if you have any questions, um, please hold those to the end of the keynote. Um, and there's a link provided in the email that was sent out by Student Services. Um, you can um, add your questions there and we'll do our best to get through them all. So today I, we have Randall Ajay here. He is an entrepreneur, speaker, and spoken word practitioner who uses his gifts to empower the message of alchemy. He was recently appointed Ontario's first poet laureate. Congratulations on that. Randall is the founder of one of Toronto's largest youth-led initiatives, reaching intelligent souls everywhere, called Rise and do and do and oh and do to mint. <laughs> Did I pronounce that right, Randall? Edutainment. Okay, thank you. I spelt it wrong, I guess. In 2018, nope. Rise received the Toronto's Arts Foundation's Mayor's Youth Arts Award. Randall's the author of I Am Not My Struggles, a power anthology, which is a collection of short poems. Released in 2018, Randall was also named CBC's Metro Mornings Trontonian of the Year in 2015, and now Magazine's Local Hero in May 2017. And in 2020, Randall opened up for the President Barack Obama at the Economic Club of Canada. So welcome, Randall, and um, please go ahead. Hello, good morning. Uh, it's so good to be here. Students, I hope you're having a good day so far. If not, that's okay. Uh, but I hope that this presentation can make your day a little bit better. Today, I'll be speaking on a number of different things. One of the things I want to talk about is, yes, definitely our mental health, but also kind of deconstructing what your mental health looks like. I'm someone who's dealt with a lot of challenges in my life, a lot of people who have brought me down, a lot of instances that have really brought me to the brink of hardship and real like breaking down. But what I want to share with you is I think that no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter what life throws your way, I want to remind you and I want to let you know that you can overcome. And it really starts up here. It starts with how we see the issues and the challenges that we're going through. Uh, I've done a lot in the mental health space. Last year, I had this opportunity to work with Kids Help Phone. We had this video that we created where we got all these artists from all across the country, all around North America, some of the biggest artists in, Can in Canadian history, uh, including Serena Ryder. And I wanted to share this video just to kind of kick off the presentation today, just something to kind of inspire you, some words of encouragement and words of affirmations that I think could really help you as well. So I'm gonna share this video. It's called What I Wouldn't Do. Um, and it's a kid's telephone commercial, which you might have seen. I was in the very beginning of the commercial uh, before everything got started, but I just want to play this for you to kind of uh, get you inspired. If you should fall to pieces, please know.
All right. I hope that song uh, was inspiring. I really loved working on the project with so many incredible artists. And one of the things that that song always reminds me is that you are not alone. No matter what you were experiencing, I want you to know that although it feels lonely, you are not alone in what you're going through. So many of us are dealing with a lot of challenges. And one of the most important things is to realize that there's people that are there to lean on, people that can help you, whether it's a close friend, a family member, someone that you are close with. I really want to ask you that when you're going through some, something, find that one person that you can lean on, that they would do anything to be there for you. All right. I want to share something with you that I've learned. I've spoken in front of thousands of people. I've been through a lot of different things in my life. But one of the things I've learned is that two of the most powerful words in the human language are I am. Two of the most powerful words in the human language are I am. Anything you say after I am dictates the way you think, feel, and believe about who you are as a person. And so it is so important to be mindful and aware of how you use your I am statements. When I was younger, I didn't grow up with my parents between the ages of one and six. And so I had a lot of negative I am statements like I am not worthy, I am not good enough, I am not loved. I had a lot of these thoughts that really affected me. And so what that caused me to do was I got into a lot of fights at school because I didn't feel like anybody cared about me. So I was looking for attention in all the wrong places, getting into fights at school, getting in trouble with the police at a really early age. I was never a bad child. I just wanted to be loved and I felt alone. I felt lonely in what I was going through and that nobody could really help me. But I've learned that it's so important to be careful of how you use your I am statements. And you know, wherever you are right now, I want you to raise your hands if you can relate to this. How many of you ever thought the words, I am not good enough, or I'm stupid, I'm dumb, right? I'm not worthy. We have these thoughts in our minds, and I want to share with you that it's so important to be mindful of the words that you allow into your mind. Your mind is like a garden. And what I mean by it being a garden is thoughts are like seeds. And every time you have a negative thought, it, it is like a negative seed that you're planting into your garden, into your mind. And so if you keep thinking and watering these thoughts, they're eventually going to grow and bloom. And then you are not going to think that you are good enough. You're going to behave in a way that is, is opposite to who you really are. And your thoughts turn to your words. Your words turn into your actions. Your actions then turn into your habits. Your habits become your character. So the next time you have a negative I am statement, where you say something like, I'm not good enough, or I'm dumb, or I'm not smart, I want you to think of a positive I am statement that does better reflect you. And wherever you are right now, if you're comfortable, I want you to say a positive I am statement, even if it's just in your head or out loud, say a positive I am statement that really reinforces how you feel about yourself. So for me, mine is I am worthy. I'm good enough, right? Maybe what I'll do is I'll share a couple of them with you. Just two I am statements that are really important to me. And if you feel comfortable sharing it, wherever you are, please do share it. All right. And it's I am excellent because I am capable. Or one of them you can say is I am good enough just as I am. Awesome. I hope you felt comfortable to share. And if you didn't, hopefully you had the thought in your mind. All right. So I mentioned that I've been through a lot of challenges in my life, and I've been through a lot of difficulties and things that I've had to navigate along my journey. And one of the hardships that I've had to learn um, and really learn to overcome is really the difficulty of transforming the challenges and the negative things that we go through into something positive. So my presentation today is called Transforming Adversity into Purpose Using the Growth Mindset. And so before I get started, how many of you are familiar with the growth mindset? If you could just put your hand up wherever you are, how many of you are familiar with the concept of the growth mindset? Cool. I can't see you, but hopefully you got to look around and see some of your peers put their hands up. But the growth mindset is something that I really love and appreciate. It has taught me a lot about myself and it's helped me to be where I am today. One thing I've learned in life is when it comes to the word adversity, some of you, some of you may not know what the word adversity means. So I want to break it down real quick. Adversity means hardship. It means challenges. It means difficulties. It means tough times that you've gone through. That's what adversity means. Just want to clear that up first. All right. So transforming challenges into purpose using the growth mindset and purpose really just means being intentional 
about what you are doing and how you are doing what you're doing. So before I get started, I want to ask you this question. And some of you may be too young. Some of you may think you don't know what your why is. But my question I want to ask you is, what is your why? When I ask you this question of what your why is, what keeps you going each day? What inspires you to be the person that you are? Maybe it might be making your parents proud. Maybe it is because you care so much about the planet and the earth and the environment that you want to see something different on this earth. Maybe it's what's happening around the world, all the wars and unjust things that are taking place around the world, and you want to make that better. Maybe what you might be navigating is just seeing a lot of hardship in your own community, people who are struggling, people who are suffering. Maybe your why is trying to alleviate some of those things. Maybe your why is something as simple as just being the best possible version of yourself. Or maybe you want to be a hockey player. Maybe you want to be a basketball player. Maybe you want to be a lawyer and just do what you do to help make the world a better place. Right? So what is your why? What I've learned is regardless of your age, what you look like, where you're from, there's so many different things that we can use to define ourselves. But any way that you define yourself, you are all going to experience challenges in your life. And what is true that I've learned is that challenges don't discriminate. They don't care if you are white, if you're black, if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're evil, if you're mean, if you're good, if you're bad, if you helped the old lady cross the street, if you donated a million dollars, or if you stole a thousand dollars, challenges are going to find you regardless. All right. And so one thing that's important to realize is what's happening to you. Maybe you're experiencing depression or you're experiencing like loss or hardship or grief or whatever you're going through, my friends. What I want to share with you is it's not happening to you because you are a bad person. It's not happening to you because you deserve it. It's not happening to you because it's trying to bring you down. These challenges are happening to you to make you a better person. And you may wonder like, who is this guy trying to tell me that what I'm going through is gonna make me a better person. I am a testament. My life is a testament that all the things that I've gone through, being arrested at 12 years old, and then graduating high school as a valedictorian in my class, being arrested again at 12 years old, three times at 12 years old, and then performing in front of Barack Obama, opening for the Olympics, traveling to Mexico. I never thought that all the things that I've been through would lead me to where I am today. So I'm a testament. My life is a testament that no matter what you go through, it doesn't have to define you. That what you're going through doesn't have to define you. It can design you. It can make you a better person. I've learned that there's seeds of opportunity in every adversity that we go through. So a seed of opportunity looks like this, all right? I often like to think of human beings, all of us, as like seeds, okay? So I like avocados. I had an avocado this morning. Let's just say an avocado seed, okay? Okay. An avocado seed has a lot of potential inside of it. In fact, it has so much potential that it can turn into an avocado tree and produce more avocados. We are like those seeds. But in order for you to allow the potential inside of the avocado seed or any seed to bloom and become what it's destined to be, you have to take it and bury it into the darkness of soil. All right? You got to take that seed and bury it into the darkness of soil. That darkness sometimes for us looks like depression looks like loneliness, looks like experiencing racism, looks like anxiety, looks like maybe like we just don't feel like we belong on this earth, like I sometimes feel like, right? That darkness, that soil, that's what it can be. It, it might bury you in that dark, that dark situation. But that dark situation, what's going to happen is it allows the seed to then crack and it breaks. But then the potential inside of that seed will then root itself into the darkness and eventually it will bloom and find its light. You, my friends, are like that seed. Sometimes you will find yourself in dark situations that will help you find your light. How do you appreciate the positivity without the negativity? How do you appreciate light without darkness? How do you appreciate good without bad? So these things happen because they're meant to help us grow. I've learned that, as, as I said, adversity does not discriminate and every adversity offers us a seed of opportunity. So my question to you is, how do you look at it? Many of us see adversity as just adversity. We see challenges and problems as just problems. But I think there's so much to learn from the problems that we go through. They offer us an opportunity to live more creative and better lives. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my, my life. So for me, some of the dark situations and challenges that I've been through um, start with when I was about 
man, it started at a really early age and I won't go too far back, but I graduated from high school in 2009. And I remember graduating. I was a valedictorian in my class. I won School Spirit Award. I got a $3,000 scholarship. I was an Ontario scholar. I got an 85% average. But what I want to say to you is four years before that, I was sitting in a jail cell at 12, like at 13 years old, I was sitting in a jail cell. What changed for me was that I started to make different choices and I surrounded myself around better friends. And the third thing is I asked myself how I can make the world a better place. That was my why. My why was I want to make the world a better place. So I looked around myself and asked myself, what could I do to help my friends, my peers, and people? I went to India. I went to Vegas. I traveled, I traveled before I graduated high school. But after I graduated, I got this job where I was getting paid $12 an hour. This is an incredible job. Like, I mean, a really, really incredible job. This job was really eye-opening. It taught me a lot of different things. Um, but unfortunately, on August 3rd, 2009, I experienced uh, a robbery. I was robbed. Uh, some people took all my stuff. And in the end, I was stabbed in my back and I got stabbed in my elbow. And some of you may feel bad for me, but I don't feel bad for what happened to me. That was a bad situation that brought about a lot of good. I was stabbed in my elbow and I was stabbed in my back. My friends didn't come to the hospital with me that day. And I realized that I was really alone, that the people who I thought were my friends weren't there for me. And it started to make me feel a little bit angry. But what I did was I felt bad for the people who did what they did to me. Because I had to think those guys who left their house wanting to stab people and rob people, they must be really broken. And what I've learned is that hurt people hurt people. All right? Hurt people hurt people. Some people who are hurt are willing to hurt other people so that they can feel better about themselves. Please don't be a victim of other hurt people. Because what they want to do is they want to hurt you. So when I realized this, I asked myself what I could do to help these guys who did what they did to me. I started this organization in 2012 called Rise, and this was a place where you can come, you can talk about all the challenges you're going through, all the adversities you're going through, and people did it through poetry, music, hip hop, dance, spoken word, a lot of different things. In 2014, I re-innovated Rise and I turned it into a social enterprise where I could really reach out and go to different schools and tell a lot of people about my story and inspire other young people to pick up a pen and to tell their story. In 2020, of course, COVID happened and we had to pivot and change things quite a bit. But the major thing I want, you to sh I want to share with you is if those guys didn't stab me that day, I wouldn't be where I am today. What happened opened my eyes and it helped me so much. You might think, how did that help you? In fact, it helped me because it helped me open my eyes to realize that I had a purpose, that I had a reason for being here, right? That I could do something good to help prevent other people from going through what I had to go through. I've learned that all of us in our lives, you know, life is like a book and you are both the author and the main character of your life. So it's important to be an observer. You want to be able to step back and ask yourself when things happen in your life, ask yourself what you can learn from that situation. When challenges come up in your life, you want to be able to step back and see it for what it is and just allow yourself to learn, to be open to what's taking place. We also talk about vulnerability, and I think vulnerability takes strength. It's not weakness. When you're going through a tough time, I really encourage you to find someone you can talk to, find someone you can be vulnerable with, find someone you can open up to and just be yourself and tell them what you're going through because vulnerability takes a lot of courage takes a lot of strength and a lot of authenticity. There's something I learned, and of course I shared with you all before about the growth mindset, but how do you apply the growth mindset? One of the ways to apply the growth mindset is to embrace challenges. To embrace challenges is to say, you know what, I'm experiencing, you know what, some people say I am depressed or some people say I'm anxious. And I, I wanna beg to differ. I wanna say that it's not that you are depressed or that you are anxious, it's that you are experiencing depression that you are experiencing anxiety. You are like, to say that you are depressed, I'm not saying that's not, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's more so to realize that it's happening to you or like it's happening, it's, it's something that you're experiencing. It's not who you are. It doesn't have to define who you are is what I'm trying to say, all right? So you wanna embrace the challenges by, as I said, being observant, but also really like leaning into the challenges trying to understand the challenge, trying to see where you can go from there, trying to see what you can learn. You also wanna persevere in the face of failure. Some people see failure as a bad thing, 
What I've learned is that failure isn't necessarily a bad thing. Failure is something that's meant to help us get closer to success. So I want you to change your mind about failure. Failure isn't a bad thing. It's good. It's really good, actually, because it teaches you more about success. The growth mindset also says that your talents, your abilities can be developed, that you're not fixed. You're not set in stone. Who you are is always open to change and become a better person. You also want to focus on the process and not the outcome. What that means is you want to focus on, for example, somebody who says that they are depressed. You want to focus on the process of learning about what caused your depression or learning about what caused the experience that you're having, learning about the situations that you experienced and how they led you to where you are, as opposed to focusing on, on getting past the depression. Some people want to just get like, I don't want to be depressed anymore. And sure, you don't want to be depressed anymore. Sure, you don't want to be anxious anymore, but along the way of getting over depression, getting over anxiety, you can learn from it because if you experience depression again and you don't learn from it, then the same thing is going to happen. It's like being in a hamster wheel over and over and over again, right? So the fixed mindset says that we have to avoid challenges, that we give up too early or you give up early without learning, that you keep your talents and abilities undeveloped, that who you are is set in stone, which I don't believe and that you focus too much on the outcome and not on the process, all right? So one of the things I've learned about transforming pain to power is um, there is something really powerful. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a quick second. There's something really powerful about your life. And I know for me, I dealt with a lot of bullying. I was bullied a lot when I was younger. I got made fun of because of the way I looked. People made fun of me because of my skin. People made fun of me because of where I was from. I was from Africa. And something that I've learned I want to share with you all is, you know, when all of us came here on this earth, none of us chose the color of our skin. None of us chose our families. None of us even chose our names when we came here on this earth. So I find it hard and very difficult because sometimes you're being bullied for something that you couldn't control. You're being bullied for something that, like, I, I got made fun of because of my ears. I got really, you got, can, can you see, I got, you're kind of small. You see, I got small ears. I got made fun of because of the size of my ears. They called me pizza pocket ears and all types of stuff. And I took it personal. But what I learned was my ears aren't going to change, <laughs> you know? They are where they are. My skin isn't going to change. My name's not going to change. Where I'm from isn't going to change. So when I said something earlier about hurt people, hurt people, sometimes some people are so hurt because maybe they've been bullied. And because they've been bullied, they want to bully you so that they can feel better about themselves. So if you've ever been bullied or you're experiencing bullying right now, what I want to say to you is don't take it personal. What they are saying to you most likely isn't true. What you're feeling may hurt, but realize that who you are is good enough. That although that person may not like you, there are millions of other people that will. The other thing I want to say is I'd love if you could repeat after me, all right? If you can say, no one's opinion of me has to become my reality, all right? So you're going to say, no one's opinion of me has to become my reality. Remember that somebody's opinion of you is just their opinion of you. It doesn't mean that it is actually true. It doesn't mean that it is fact. It is just how they see you. It is just what they think, not the actual truth. So don't allow someone's words or someone's thoughts or opinions of you to become your truth. The other thing I learned is when I mentioned earlier that the two powerful, the two most powerful words in human language are I am, I learned that there's two ways of looking at your identity. You have something called your social identity, and then you have something called your self-identity. Your social identity is how other people see you. It is how other people view you because of the way you look, because of maybe where you live, because of you know where you're from. It's how people view you. And then you have something called your self-identity, which is how you view yourself. There's only one that you have control over, and that is your self-identity. You only have control over your self-identity. Your social identity and how other people see you, you can't control it. Frankly, it's none of your business. If someone likes you, that's not your business. If they don't like you, that's not your business either. You have to realize that some people are going to like you and some people are not going to like you. Some people are going to treat you well and some people are not going to treat you well. But those who don't treat you well and those who do treat you well, that's really not your business. What is your business is how you see yourself. If you believe in yourself, if you have confidence in yourself, 
if you see yourself the way you want to be seen in a respectful light and in a positive way, I want to tell you that that is more important than how other people are going to see you. So it's really, really important to keep in mind that your, your ability to overcome people's thoughts about you is really, really important. And that's one way to transform your pain to power. Just stepping back for a second, take a moment to step back and really take Take, take stock of how you see yourself and how you really want to be able to overcome what you're dealing with. The final thing I'll say is I got made fun of a lot because of the color of my skin, like I said, and that really affected my mental health because there's nothing I could do to change my skin. There's nothing I could do to change the fact that I'm African. You know, My parents are who they are. My ancestors are who they are, but because none of us chose the color of our skin and some people you know, there's some people on this earth that have a lighter skin tone. And, you know, for lack of a better word, some people are white. And being white means in this world, we inherited something called race, right? And so race is a social construct. What it means is that we all participate in this social construct. It's to say that it's really not real in a way. It's not real in the sense that because you are this, you are here, or because you're this, you're here. We all created that and we all inherited it. But we have an opportunity to make a difference because whether you're white, you're black, you're brown, whatever skin tone you are, none of us chose the color of our skin. And so some of us, you know, like myself, are oppressed because of the color of our skin. And some people receive privilege because of the color of, our, of their skin. And that's something we all inherited. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But it's really important to notice and note, like, just because you have privilege and other people don't, it doesn't necessarily mean you can use the privilege against them. What it means is that you can use your privilege to actually help other people because none of us chose the color of our skin. None of us have control over that, right? And so for me, it was really hard to overcome because it wasn't something I could change. I changed my friends. I changed the people who were making fun of me. I changed my circle around, and that really opened the doors a little bit for me, right? Another way to transform your pain to power, as I said earlier, is to you really want to be mindful of how you show up each day. I like to start my day for myself with my mental health. I like to start my day doing a meditation. I like to start my day checking in on myself. You know, a lot of us, when we wake up in the morning, the first thing we do is we grab our phones. You grab your phone, you check Instagram, you check Twitter, you check Snapchat, you check TikTok, you're checking everything else that everyone else is doing. But have you taken the time to check in with yourself? So before you pick up your phone, you check in what everyone's doing, what everyone else is doing in the world. How about we take a moment to check in with ourselves and just breathe before you pick up your phone, you know, before you grab your phone, just lay there for a second and take a moment to reflect on how am I feeling today? What type of day do I want to have? What am I grateful for? What type of, what do I have to do today? Take a moment just to reflect on yourself before you pick up your phone and before you check in on other people. And at the end of the night, I really encourage you just to take stock on all the good things that happened. Take stock of a highlight, one highlight, one good thing that happened before you go to sleep, before you you know, check your phone before the, before the night is over. All right. I'm going to start my slides again. And great. There's a book that I learned uh, called The Four Agreements by someone named Don Miguel Ruiz. And one thing he says is you want to be impeccable with your word. To be impeccable, the word impeccable means flawless. It means perfect, right? You want to be perfect with your word. What that means is you never want to say anything negative about yourself or about anyone else. You don't wanna use your words in a way that degrades or brings you down or brings other people down because your words are very powerful. And if you say negative things about other people, then you're gonna hurt other people's feelings. The next thing he says, the second agreement is don't take anything personal. To not take anything personal is to realize that people will have their opinions of you, people will say things to hurt you, but if you take it personal and you take what they say as truth, then that is a choice that we are making. So when someone is bullying you, as hard as it is, please try your best not to take it personal. Know that often that person is having a bad day or that person's going through something, maybe an insecurity, maybe something happened to them. I know for me, when I was bullying other kids, what happened is because I was bullied, I was bullying other kids. So a lot of bullies have also been bullied themselves. So there are bullies who've been bullied and wanna bully other people so that they can feel better. And then that bully is going to create another bully. And then that bully is going to create another bully. There's a lot of things that happen. So you try not to take things personal. The third one he says is don't make any assumptions. To not make any assumptions is really to realize that when something happens, you may not necessarily understand why it happened or why it took place, but you want to ask questions for clarity. 
The fourth one is always do your best. You know, at the end of the day, your best is going to be here one day. It's going to be here the next day. It's going to be here another day. But as long as you can look yourself in the mirror or ask yourself, did I do my best today? That's all that matters. All right. Um, I'm going to skip through this a little bit. There's a book that I learned called The Authenticity Principle. And this is by an author named Ritu Basin. And Ritu talks about being authentic, being true. The word authentic is being true to yourself, being genuine about who you are and how you show up in the world. And so I think it's really important to share with you that being authentic in this world is really important because by being authentic, by being yourself, by being true to who you are, you're going to attract other people in your life that are more likely to appreciate you for you. But so often, some of us feel like we have to be something we're not or someone we're not to be accepted by other people. So quick show of hands. How many of you have ever felt like you had to be something you were not to be accepted by other people? Show of hands. Cool. So again, sometimes it's like you feel like you have to pretend to be something you're not so that other people can like you. But what I want to say is it's more important to be your authentic self because your performative self is essentially a version of yourself that you think you have to be for other people to like you. Your performative self is a side of yourself where you feel like you have to do things that other people are doing because you want to be their friends. Your adaptive self is kind of a blend between both. Sometimes you're authentic, sometimes you're performative. And that's based on the people that you surround yourself with. I also think when it comes to mental health, you want to be a safe space for other people to be themselves. So sometimes we think about mental health and we talk a lot about safe spaces. But I think it's also important like, to have a good friend who is safe to you. To have a good friend who is someone that you can lean on, someone you can trust to talk to them. But can you also be that for somebody else? Do you have a friend that you can be a safe space for? That when they're going through a challenge, you can be there for them? That they can come to you when they're in a moment of need? In, in a moment of need? And also check in on your strong friends. Some of your friends are really strong people, and they're always there for you. They're always there when you need them. They're always there when you are going through something. But can you check in on them? And ask them, like, are you okay? Because those people are often going through their own stuff too. And because they're so strong, sometimes they won't tell us that they're going through something. Um, I asked this question earlier. I'm going to ask you again. What is your why, my friend? So what is your why? What keeps you going? What keeps you motivated when times get tough? I've learned that there's 7 billion different ways of looking at happiness. And looking at happiness looks like a lot of different ways. But you have to define happiness for yourself. All right? You got to define happiness for you. And understand that happiness is something that you have to define, not allow other people to define. Some of you have been told that being happy is having a big house and a nice car, new shoes, a great partner, you know, having a great job. And I'm not saying that doesn't make you happy, but that might not be somebody else's happiness, right? So there's a lot of different ways of looking at happiness, but you have to define what happiness looks like for you. What is your version of happiness? How does your happiness, how does happiness look like for you? Mother Teresa has this quote that says, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. What that means is to find you and to find who you are, one of the best ways is to dedicate yourself to helping other people, to serving other people, to giving back to other people, to being a support for other people on their journey. On that note, I'm gonna pause my slides and um, just gonna wrap up before we get into a, a short Q&A. Something I, I shared earlier about happiness. Um, when I was 17 years old, I went to India. And being in India, I was in Bengal. It was a beautiful time to be in India. I was there on a volunteer trip. I went to the Taj Mahal. And if you don't know the story of the, of the Taj Mahal, what essentially it is, is this man loved his wife so much that he built her a billion dollar home. He got people from all the way in Europe to come to India and build this home for his wife because he loved his wife so much. And that's the story of the Taj Mahal. After we left the Taj Mahal, we went to another temple just down the street. And I was feeling so good. I was feeling excited. You know, we were at the Taj Mahal. And then I see this man. And this man has leprosy all over his skin. And leprosy is a skin condition. It's a skin disease that just is like, just discolors all your skin. And it's itchy. It's flaky. It's hard to look at. But he had the leprosy all over his skin. Not only did he have leprosy all over his skin, but he had no legs. And he would have this wooden board, kind of like this size, with wheels under. And he would sit on the board and just use his hands to roll around. And that's how the man got around. 
On top of that, the man was poor. He was sitting in front of his temple, no legs, leprosy all over his skin with a tin can in his hands. And this is exactly what he was doing with the biggest smile on his face. And I'm 17 years old. I see this man and I'm thinking, you have no legs, no money, and you have leprosy all over your skin. Why are you smiling? You have no reason to smile. But he taught me a lesson that day. What he taught me was that happiness is something that is defined by you and you alone. Happiness is found inside of you. Some of you may think if I get a new PlayStation 5 or a new iPhone 15, then I'll be happy. If I get a new car, I'll be happy. If I get that $100, I'll be happy. Well, what, what happens when the $100 is gone and you spent it all? When the new shoes are old and are no longer new? When the PlayStation 5 crashes? When the new car or whatever it is that you want crashes and it's no longer new anymore? There goes your happiness. But happiness, what I'm trying to say is happiness is something that you have to find inside of you. Don't allow somebody else to define happiness for you. You have to define what makes you happy. Maybe happiness is some, something as simple as having a couple friends, going to school, coming home, spending time with your family, eating food, playing baseball, playing hockey, playing basketball, drawing, doing art, whatever. Like You have to ask yourself and define what makes me happy and write it down. Take a moment to write it down. Write down what makes you happy. Right? It's so important to know what makes you happy. The other thing I want to share with you before I go, or sorry, before we, we wrap it into a Q&A, is there's a story that I learned, and this story is called the chicken and the um, sorry, it's called the eagle and the ch and the chicken, and I'll, I'll share with it real quick. I'll share with you real quick. Once upon a time, high up in a mountain top, there was an eagle's nest, and inside of that eagle's nest were two eggs. One day, when the mama eagle left to, to go get some food, there was a strong gust of wind that came and blew one of the eggs out of the nest, and it went tumbling, tumbling, tumbling down the side of the mountain. And it landed on this fresh piece of grass. A few days passed, and the farmer was walking. A farmer was walking on his, on his grass, checking the pastures, checking his crops, and making sure everything was okay, when he saw this big, gigantic egg. He picked up the egg and noticed the egg was a little bit bigger than his chicken's eggs. But, hmm, he had this idea. He took this, this eagle's egg, and he put it under one of his chickens. A week passed and all the chicks started to hatch around the same time. This mama chicken taught all the chicks to walk like chickens, how to eat like chickens, and how to be like chickens. And so one day they were walking on the field and this baby eagle looked up in the sky and saw this beautiful majestic bird in the sky. And he turned to his friends and he said, what's that bird? What is that in the sky? And all the other chicks said, oh, that, that's an eagle. And the baby eagle said, oh my God, one day I want to be just like that. And the other chicks said, what? <laughs> you want to be what? They laughed at him. He said, you're a chicken. You'll never be an eagle. We don't fly. Chickens don't fly. But the baby eagle felt like there was something inside of it, something different. So the next day it stood on this cliff. And the next day the baby eagle jumped off the cliff and went, splat on its face. And all the chicks said, ha, ah, we told you, you can't fly, you'll never fly, stop trying. But the baby eagle stood on that cliff the next day. It jumped, it flapped its wings and it fell on his face again and the chicks kept laughing and laughing. The next day he fell again and they kept laughing. The next day he fell again and they kept laughing. But the next day he flew a little bit and landed on its feet. And all the other chicks said, ha, 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 ha. The next day, the baby eagle stood on that cliff again, and he got a little bit further. The next day, he stood on that cliff again, and he got even further. The next day, the baby eagle stood on the cliff and had all this confidence in it, spread its wings, jumped off that cliff, flapped its wings, and it never came back to the farm. It was gone. The moral of the story is many of you are like the baby eagle, but some of you are surrounded by chicks and people who don't want to see you rise up to where you're capable of rising. Some people don't see the potential inside of you. And so what they do is they would rather keep you on the ground as opposed to seeing you be the, what you're destined to be. What I wanna share with you is sometimes you're gonna have people who don't want to see you be the best that you're destined to be. 
Some people will share things that will bring you down. Some people will say things that will make you feel bad about yourself. Some people will say things about what you can and cannot do. But it's up to you to determine how high you fly or how low you go. So this is why I say don't allow other people's opinion of you to become your reality. Know who you are. Love who you are. Appreciate who you are. Check in on yourself. Know yourself. And realize that you don't have to allow other people's thoughts of you to define who you are. Before we wrap um, this portion and we get into the Q&A, the last thing I want to say is when it comes to your mental health and it comes to taking care of yourself, know that it's all in your control. At the end of the day, at the end of a tough day, maybe think of three things that you can do that can help make you feel better about yourself. Sometimes making you feel like just feeling better can be going for a short walk in your neighborhood. Maybe it's just playing sports. Maybe it's drawing. Maybe it's writing poetry like me. Maybe it's reading a book. I want, to, I want you to take a moment to think of what are three things I can do when I'm not feeling good, when my mental health is, is just, <clears throat> what can I do to feel better about myself? When I'm down, what are three things that I can do to bring me up? So I want you to take a moment just really to reflect on what are those three things that you can do that can really help you. And I'll give you an example. For me, it's going for a walk in my neighborhood. The second thing is it's meditating. It's sitting down with myself and having a meditation. The third thing is sometimes it's just writing, writing out my thoughts and journaling. This morning I was journaling and I was talking about what was happening and what I'm feeling and what's going on in my life. Because as positive as I am, I got stuff going on in my life too. And so I think it's important to think about three things that you can do that can really help you feel a lot better about yourself. All right. And the final thing I want to share with you before we get into the q and I know I think I feel like I've said this a couple of times, but the final thing I want to share with you is you are very powerful, my friends. Like you are so powerful. You are so powerful that if you live a positive life and do good things for other people, if you spread positivity to other people, the world will mirror positivity back to you. Now, I'm not saying that you won't experience some challenges. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you are a positive person, if you treat other people with respect, if you think kindly of yourself, if you are of service and helping other people, trying to make other people's lives a little bit better and your own better, yours will be better too. You are that powerful that what you do mirrors itself right back to you. What you put out is what you get back. That is how powerful you are. So you have to realize how powerful you are that your thoughts, your actions, your words, and your intentions can really create the life that you want to live. So if you want to live a good life, do good to other people. If you want to experience love, share love with other people. If you want to experience a lot of money, share what you have with other people. If you want to receive a lot of money, be grateful for what you already have, all right? It's so important to keep that in mind because you are very powerful. You're powerful than what you think you are, and there's so much goodness inside of you. So at this time, I'm going to pause. I know I shared a lot, but if there's any questions that you have, maybe your classrooms have questions, maybe you have a personal question, I want to say, please don't be shy. You know, please don't be shy to ask your questions. I'm here to help you, and I care a lot about all of you. I don't know you, and I can't even see you. But I care about you. I do because I care a lot about people. So please take a take your take your time. Think of your questions, and uh, we'll we'll look for them in the chat. Hi, Randell. Um, first, thank you, thank you. I know we're all feeling inspired, and I know we've all connected with the things that you've shared with us. So first of all, thank you. Um, I just have the questions here on my computer that are coming. In so I'll, I'll uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can. And and thank you to Deseranto Kenti and Prince Edward Collegiate for sending in some questions already. Um, we'll start with just this this one question from a grade twelve student. Um, what advice would you have for a graduating student who's going to be doing something new and maybe have times where they feel like they're on their own and alone doing that new thing? You know, sometimes it's a lonely journey figuring out what you're doing. And I'll share with you, when I told my friends, I told my parents I wanted to be a poet, I wanted to be a speaker, my parents were disappointed. They said, you're better than that. You can be an engineer, a lawyer, a doctor. When I told my friends what I wanted to do, they said, I, I don't think that's a good idea. You're not going to make money off of it. So I felt very lonely. What I want to say to you is your vision is your vision. Other people can't see the vision that you have because it's yours. And it will feel lonely when you get started, but eventually you will find people around you that are similar to what you're doing. But also, if you're in grade 12, right, 
and you feel lonely, it's okay. It's it's completely okay because at, at 17, it's kind of like a cocoon period. It's a period where you're kind of in this cocoon trying to figure out the next step so that you can kind of break out of the cocoon and be the butterfly that you're destined to be. But know your vision and only share your vision with a few people that you really trust. The third thing I would say is try to connect with people, whether it's online or in person, that share the same vision that you have. So at least you don't feel alone, right? But find that one person. If you don't have an online community or a personal community, find that one person that you can lean on and trust. The final thing I would say, and there's so much I can say to that, but the final thing I can say is I want you to journal. Like, Take a moment to grab a journal and just put your thoughts on paper. What you're feeling, what you're thinking, and what you're experiencing, put it on paper. Because it may feel lonely, but sometimes in order to be and get to greatness, it's a lonely journey. I'm telling you, greatness is a lonely journey. And to get to where I am, I've had a lot of moments of loneliness. And it's not to say that you are alone. Like Realize that being lonely is very different than being alone. Being lonely is not the same as being alone. Loneliness is a negative. It can be a negative thing. But being alone means that you're just on your own journey. But eventually, the people that you are meant to be around, you'll attract those people into your life. And I lied. The final thing I say is I, like, just really take a moment to like envision the type of people you want to have in your life. Like, Just think about those people. Think about the type of people you want around you. And like, kind of like, you know, not to like spiritually, whether you want to pray on it, you want to meditate on it, or you just want to speak it out or write it down. Like there's something powerful about writing down your goals on paper and seeing it come to life. But that's what I can share so far. Thank you so much. Um, and our next question is um, from Sterling Public School and just wondering if in those dark times um, you found someone that you could look up to. Yeah, um, my grade five teacher, my grade eight teacher, um, and I had a lot of teachers in high school that I could really lean on. I think sometimes there's people that you will attract in your life that will really help you. But know that in those dark times, um, you, you really want to lean on yourself, but you want to find a few people that you can also trust and lean on to. But definitely it was a hard, it was a, a journey. Um, and I think, I think just, you want to find a mentor, someone that you can just go to, like a mentor is really helpful. Uh, that's kind of along the journey that you're looking to go on. But I, I, I definitely agree with finding people that can help you. Thank you. Um, and a, another one from Sterling Public School. Uh, how did you come to realize that I am are the strongest words? I realized that I am are the strongest words because when I was younger and I said things like I am not good enough and I am worthy, I then started to think it. So from thinking it, I started to speak it and then I started to believe it. And so when I said I wasn't worthy, some people would say, give me compliments and I wouldn't take it. I just felt so low. I felt so like degraded. I didn't feel good enough for anything and anyone. And so when I kept saying these, I am, I'm lonely, I'm, I'm alone, I'm, I'm not worthy. When I kept saying these things, what I realized was I am was really important. So all I had to do was say, I am and change it and say, I am enough. I am loved. I am cared for. Once I started thinking these things, lo and behold, I started reaching out to the right, the right people. Just like I'm on the bus and I had this conversation with somebody and we became friends. We're still friends to this day. 15 years later, I went to this restaurant and then there's somebody, uh, somebody who's having a conversation. We met and now we're friends. And so it's like this mindset that you want to be able to shift. And I just think it's so important to have an I am statement, like one I am statement that really best reflects you. Because not only does it affect your brain and the way you think, but it affects the way you talk about yourself, affects the way you act as well too, and affects who you become. And that's why I think I am is so powerful. Thank you, Sterling. I appreciate that, Sterling. That's that's a great two great questions. Um, we, we have another uh, question here from Parkdale School, um, wondering why is it, important to understand your purpose? I think it's important to understand your purpose because every single one of you came here on this earth with this purpose that's embedded inside of you. I want you to think of it like a treasure chest, all right? There's a treasure chest buried deep inside of you, and that is your purpose. And life is like taking a shovel and digging through the dirt and just digging through the dirt and digging through the dirt. And sometimes you have to dig through the dirt to get to the gold. So when you find that gold, which is your purpose, right? It allows you to navigate the world with a sense of direction 
It allows you to navigate the world kind of knowing what you want to do and why it's important to know your purpose is. Let's say somebody says, hey, let's go behind the back of the school and let's do X. Let's do some things we're not supposed to do. When you know your purpose, you know that that choice is not a part of the path that you need to be on. This is your purpose. This is the path that you're walking on. Someone says, hey, let's go steal something. That's not on my purpose. Nope. This is my purpose. This is my lane. Let's go bully this kid. Nope. This is this is my purpose. So outside influences can affect your purpose, if you don't know where you're looking to go, your your purpose is kind of the direction you're looking to go in. And sometimes you don't want to veer off into the wrong course or wrong direction, but other people who don't have the same purpose as you or other people who don't see the vision that you have. And lastly, it's important to know your purpose because you all are you all are incredible people. Like you were like you are amazing and you are special and you are unique and you are so talented. If you find out what your purpose is, you can make the world a better place. Can you imagine this kid, me, at 12 years old who was arrested three times at 12 years old? Can you imagine me performing in front of Barack Obama? Can you imagine me being traveling and meeting Terry Crews, meeting Simon Cowell and them like giving me, ha like clapping for me because I share my poetry. Like there's something really powerful about what you're destined to do here on this earth, my friends, like something very, very powerful. And it's important to know your purpose because it can help you do some powerful things. Thank you. And um, just uh, time for, for one more question um, from, Kente Public School, uh, do you have any regrets? And if you do, how do you work through them or deal with them? I don't have any regrets because I love who I am today. I love the person that I've become. I love, like, I love me. You know what I mean? Like, I love me. I love me a lot. I've been through, I've hated me a long time for a long time in my life that eventually I learned to love me. And so I don't have any regrets because I've been very disciplined. So there's two different kinds of pain that are really difficult. There's a pain of discipline and there's a pain of regret. I've chosen to be disciplined. And by being disciplined, it's following my purpose. When I was following my purpose, writing my poetry, working on my, my entrepreneurship, my friend said, hey, let's come hang out. No, I can't. I'm focusing on my purpose. Hey, let's go smoke a joint. No, I can't. I'm focusing on my purpose. I, I, didn't, I didn't do the things that people told me to do because I knew what I wanted to do. So I don't have any regrets in my life because I was more disciplined as opposed to, to, to focusing on regrets. I focus on a lot of discipline and um, yeah, no regrets. And I think it's okay to make mistakes, but as long as you learn from your mistakes, you won't regret them. Like if you learn from your mistakes, you won't regret the mistakes you make because mistakes don't define you. Like the mistakes don't define you. It's just a failure, just a mistake that you made. It's called a mistake, that's it. Take another one. Take another shot at it. Right? It's just a mistake. You missed it, but you can get it. You can get it the next time. So I don't have any regrets. Not at all. I love that. Um, we have so many amazing questions, and um, uh, I, I have to sort of go in order here. But here's one from Trenton High School. Um, what would you say to people who feel like their happiness is when they're playing video games or watching TV? Um, how do you know that, or like, are there criteria for um, sort of being aware of what makes you happy? So I, I have friends that will watch TV all day and play video games all day. And you know what? Like what I'll say is there's nothing wrong with watching TV or video games, but I have friends who use it as an escape. So, so what I'd say to you is, if you're playing video games because you don't want to deal with the challenges that you're going through in life, maybe something happened, someone said something to you, and you're like, you know what, I want to block it out and I'm just going to play video games. If you're playing video games because you don't want to deal with the problems that you have, then I would say that you have to change that behavior. If you're playing video games, and maybe that's what makes you happy because being happy or be playing video games gives you happiness and lets you forget all the other stuff that you're going through. So what I would say is, Yes, you can be happy playing video games, but if you're playing video games like 10, 12 hours a day, I think me, from my experience, you're running from something. You're hiding from something. If you're watching TV all day, you're running from something. It means you don't want to deal with the problems that you're going through. So what I'd say to you is, can you say, you know what, I'm going to play video games. for? If you play video games four hours a day right now, can you do it for two hours and then find something else to do? Can you play it for like an hour and a half? Then maybe go talk to your friend or go, you know, because I think it's important to build relationships. And sometimes video games and technology can take us away from relationships. And so you're, it's just you and the screen, right? But then you're losing out on time to build friendships and connect with other people. 
also you can you can build friendships with people who are you're gaming with and that's true but there's also a real life and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with video games because i played video, video games too but just don't run from your problems and run towards video games that's what i would say ah, i wish we had more time I know, it's me been too. absolutely <laughs> amazing Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to come speak with us today. Such valued advice, very powerful and wise words, Randall. Just absolutely amazing. Uh, my feel, my spirit feels it. Uh, it definitely does feel it. And you know, it's a it's a great you know your words are a great reminder for us to be mindful that our thoughts turn in, turn into our words, that our words turn into our actions. And our actions can turn into our character, you know, um, how adversity is the seed of opportunity, which mm. is amazing, right? Like, and it's so true. Mm. Um, and that we are the author and characters of our own lives, right? Absolutely. So we write our stories and we make our choices. Absolutely. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, I don't want to put you on the spot, but to close out today, do you have potentially a, po you know where I'm going with this? <laughs> exactly where you're going. Awesome, awesome. And again, um, thank you so much um it's uh like so powerful so powerful i got you um i was actually hoping that i could share this poem so i I'm, i love that this worked out um this poem i want to share is called um i am an artist and uh i just love this poem because it's a reminder like when i say i am and for me i identify as an artist but i believe all of us are artists all of us like all of us are artists what i mean by that is Actually, as you said jolie we are the authors and the protagonists of our story so because you are the author of your own life through your choices, your actions, your words, you're writing it. So you are the artist and the author, the artist, sorry, you are the author and the artist of your own life. So that's what I mean by being an artist, that your life is like a blank canvas. And every day you wake up, your choices are like painting that brush and painting that picture. So this is called I'm an artist. I am an artist and I don't have any time to be silent. No time to allow these words to asphyxiate my ancestry amidst this violence, amidst this despair. I can't deny the world my gift because of fear. You cannot deny the world your gift because of fear. Living a life of purpose and service cannot and will not die with my gift still in here. Inspired by my pain and how close death came. Images of a tombstone inscribed with my name. Just then I snapped back to a new era, a new lane, and then my real eye realized that I could be the one to make a change. Because see, I am an artist, creator of lyrical calligraphy, take you on a journey with my soliloquies, literary imagery is full of healing. May my words add meaning to your life and the thoughts you left behind with the things that I write. May my words penetrate your soul, levitate your being beyond the thoughts that you think you know. Because see, if you ignore the call of your dreams, if you ignore the call of your dreams, it can be lethal. Especially when you tell your big dreams to small-minded people. Pumping in the depths of me is my heartistry, this life-giving gift that I was given. How can I deny the world the gift of the creator's imprint? How dare I suppress the talents etched in the flesh of my chest? Am I not grateful? Do I not cherish it? Randell, have you not realized that this is a ticket to your exodus? See, sometimes when we are chasing our dreams or finding our purpose, we're going to ask if it's worth it. But have you not realized that by not doing it, you are causing the world a disservice. One more time, sometimes we'll ask that the world is causing us a disservice so that by not using your purpose, it's causing a disservice, a failure to fulfill your purpose. Because see, I am an artist, consistently pushing pens and pencils, living in my purpose, practicing my pure potential to be artists. We have to get creating when the world is devastated. We are the beacons of hope healing to suicide notes we change people's lives with our gifts so no matter how rough it gets don't quit know that you are an image of the infinite every choice that we make fulfills our life's pages see the road ahead is going to be tough but remain patient know that you are designing magic in the making so when the blueprint of your story is read will it free others 
from the matrix. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hopefully the, the poem resonated with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randall. And uh, we wish you all of the best. And um, yeah. thanks to everyone for joining us yes. today. And thank it's you been wonderful. Me. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Bye. Bye.